morning, everyone, and welcome back to today's update. We will begin uh, today's update by asking Dr. Janice Fitzgerald for her overnight update on COVID-19. Thank you, Premier. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Since the media advisory yesterday, we have one new positive case in the province. Uh, the case is female under the age of 20 and is in the Central Health Region. Today's case is considered a close contact of yesterday's case. All those considered close contacts have been advised to quarantine. The total number of cases in our province is 264. By region, we have 244 cases in Eastern Health, 10 in Central Health, 4 in Western Health, and 6 in Labrador Grenfell Health. 52% of cases are female and 48% are male. By age, we have 23 under the age of 20, 39 between 20 and 39, 39 between 40 and 49, 59 between 50 and 59, 57 between 60 and 69, and 47 who are 70 and above. 259 people have now recovered, and in total we have tested 22,710 people. As of July 20th across Canada, we have seen an increase in the number, the weekly number of new cases when compared to the previous week. Young people in the age bracket of 20 to 39 are accounting for a greater proportion of these newly reported cases than previously. This trend has in part been attributed to social gatherings where public health guidelines have not been followed. I understand it's been an exceptionally difficult winter and spring, and you've all risen to the challenge of COVID that COVID-19 has presented. But now is not time to become lax in our public health measures. We've done really well in preventing outbreaks in our community communities. We must stay the course and be keenly aware that this virus is still with us and active around the world. So we all have a role in keeping COVID-19 under control in our province. Please continue to stay home when you are unwell, cover coughs and sneezes, practice good hand hygiene, maintain a safe physical distance of two arms lengths from others while in the workplace or public spaces, and wear a non-medical mask when that's not possible. These protective measures continue to be our best defense against this virus. Summer is here at long last, and as you continue to enjoy the season and the pleasant weather we have been fortunate to have so far, Please continue to be mindful of people, space, time, and place. Keep your number of close contacts outside your bubble as low as you can. Be sure any space you're in is large enough to allow physical distancing. The longer your exposure to those outside your bubble, the higher the risk of transmission if COVID is present. And indoor activities are higher risk than outdoor activities. So remember, people, space, time, place. Let those words guide you in your activities and your travels this summer. So within our province, new cases always serve as a reminder that COVID-19 is still with us. It also shows us the importance of our public health measures and, and how the importance they play in preventing the spread of the virus. And while we may sometimes find them challenging, we must not be complacent with these measures. We will continue to see cases, and it is important that people feel safe and supported to come forward to be tested. Testing is an important tool for public health. It helps us to identify cases and their contacts so that we can stop transmission of the virus beyond a small cluster of cases. This is one way how we prevent the spread of diseases like COVID-19 in our communities. We must be kind to one another in our words and our actions. Kindness has helped us get through this pandemic so far. As people test positive, they must feel supported and be treated with this same kindness. As many can relate, testing positive for any illness can be scary for both the person and their family members. COVID-19 is no different. Put yourself in their shoes before you decide to make a comment on social media and ask yourself, what would I want someone to say to me if I was in this situation. As a recap for those who may have just joined us, we have one new case since yesterday's media advisory in the Central Health Region. The total number of cases in the province is now 264. In true Newfoundland and Labrador fashion, we have persevered through the adversity that came with the rise of this pandemic, and we will continue to do so. It is the strength and support in our communities that will get us through, and we will do it together. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald. And what we've said over the 
last number of weeks, indeed, since we've announced the uh, uh, living life with COVID-19 in Newfoundland and Labrador, that we have done an incredible job in flattening the curve, and that new cases of COVID-19, well, it's not totally une uh, unexpected. And they, as Dr. Fitzgerald just said, they actually serve as a reminder that COVID is still amongst us. Now, over the last couple of months, we've been moving forward with our plan, and we've moved from alert level five to where we are today at alert level two. This plan is balanced. It's, it's a gradual approach to reopening our economy in our province. Now, every step that we have taken and will take is based on advice from our public health officials and based on good science. This is all part of learning how we live with the virus among us. What's important to keep in mind, however, is that the two new cases this week, officials have been able to follow contact tracing and continue to monitor these ca cases slowly. And this is something that should not be lost on us. We have an excellent contact tracing team in place that when cases do pop up from time to time, we have the, uh, we have the mechanism in place to follow these cases. I also want to say that even though there's been a lot of comments on social media and other places of how these cases, how those positive cases, how they are connected to the Atlantic bubble. Well, I want to be very clear. These are not connected to the Atlantic bubble in any way, shape, or form. These are travelers from outside of Atlantic Canada. Aside from what I've already said, that there are also questions around some workers today coming into the province from the United States. These individuals are, are deemed essential workers by the federal government. They are tested before they leave the United States, and these essential workers are then tested again before entering their workplace here in our province. These are essential workers, and when they're not working, they are in self-isolation. And when they cannot physically distance themselves from others, they wear a mask, and even to the point where they do not eat meals with their colleagues. What's important to keep in mind is that the federal and the provincial guidelines are in place. So it all comes down to putting the right guidelines in place and being responsible for our actions by following these guidelines. We must always remain attentive to our actions and follow the important guidelines so that we continue to move forward as a province. First and foremost, we will always keep your safety as a priority. Travel continues to be closely monitored by our public health officials and our Chief Medical Officer of Health. And this also includes discussions around the Atlantic bubble. If you absolutely need uh, to travel to our province, to travel into Newfoundland and Labrador, well, we have a mechanism in place. These are exemption orders, and you can apply for those online. Any further broader movement to any other Canadian jurisdictions or discussions around families connected to our province or easing travel restrictions for Newfoundland and Labrador will be determined and guided by public health experts and our chief medical officer of health. Safety of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians is our priority. If we look at the la latest travel numbers as an example for our province, I just mentioned to you about exemption orders. It shows that just over 10,000 travel exemption requests have been approved within a timeline of May 4th to, June, uh, to July 19th. So when you look at the all points of entry, uh, as an example, there's a total of 1,049 people came into our province just yesterday. Now the busiest area continues to be the Lab West border. This is the area from Fermont and Quebec and into Lab West where there were some of the uh, 1,049, there were some 370 people came through that part of the province. And this has been consistent around the 40% of the total number for people coming into Newfoundland and Labrador. So I guess when you put those numbers in context, those 1,049 people entering Newfoundland and Labrador yesterday, you can tell that you're not seeing a huge amount of people coming into our province when you compare this to previous years. If anything is to change with travel restrictions, whether it's within the Atlantic bubble or further expansion, I can assure you that we will inform you well in advance. This is what we've done in the past in all other aspects of this pandemic. And also speaking of informing you, as many of you would have known, that the first the Canada's first ministers, our premiers, announced the Safe Start uh, Agreement last week with the federal government. 
It's a $19 billion agreement in combination of uh, provincial and federal, sometimes cost shared, uh, sometimes the distribution is on a per capita basis, and in some cases it's a needs-based funding. Newfoundland and Labrador, I can assure you, will re receive its fair share, at least $146 million on a per capita basis, but even that will be increased with further funding that will be uh, distributed on a needs and a cost shared arrangement. So before the details of the agreement are finalized, Newfoundland and Labrador will consider the requirements to offset the cost of COVID-19 with our public transit system. Uh, what the Safe Start Agreement does is comes down to providing further help to our economy and social needs and possible uh, prepare for future waves of COVID-19. This is federal money of the $19 billion that I'm talking about. Now, speaking of supports, I want to provide an update on a couple of the programs that we put in place over the last few months. In early June, we launched a $30 million residential construction rebate program. That includes a 25% rebate on renovation projects and a $10,000 rebate for new home construction. We've received over 2,600 applications, so this has been a, a very uh, positively accepted program that we've put in place. The contractor applications are currently being processed, so there's some uh, approximately 830 applications have been received from contractors. So there's an email account that has been set up to assist with the inquiries. Like any new program, you're going to get questions. So if you have questions uh, pertaining to the status of the homeowner pre-approvals or policy questions, well, the email there would be residentialrebate at gov.nl.ca. But contractors, they can have questions too, of course. And if they have questions about the enrollment status or the general questions about the program itself related to contractors, well, we've been partnering with the Canadian Home Builders Association, and you can email uh, those folks at amin at uh, chbanl.ca. So this is the Canadian Home Builders Association. Now, the next phase of the program will be to review applications received from individual homeowners for renovation uh, projects. You can appreciate that these new programs, when they're put in place, the applications are being worked through, and you may encounter sometimes a little delay, but I ask for your patience as your uh, applications are being processed. It's a very busy program. We're also pleased to say that the $25 million Tourism and Hospitality Support Program, which was announced, this one was announced in May, is also making a positive difference to our province. It's a program that's assisting businesses and in turn communities throughout Newfoundland and Labrador. This program was launched to support eligible program or tourism operators with a one-time non-repayable contribution of either $5,000 or $10,000. This, of course, dependent on your gross sales in the previous years. So to date, there's some 630 approvals that have been issued. So uh, the uh, staff at the tourism and, uh, department has been very busy for, your, uh, for the hospitality operators who have been impacted by COVID-19. And so this, of course, is all complementary is in addition to the federal programs that have been put in place as well. Also, you might have seen Minister Davis on your recent travels around the province. He's been very busy highlighting some of the many incredible tourism, uh, tourist destinations. So I'm also pleased to see that residents who have been taking time to explore a beautiful province this summer. There's certainly no lack of areas to visit. It's a great opportunity to discover, in some cases, rediscover for some of for some of you and appreciate what we have here in our province. As you will see in your travels, these businesses have been abiding by the uh, health guidelines and putting necessary measures in place to keep you safe during your stay home year 2020 adventures. So it's always a pleasure to hear some good news coming out of the many supports and resources available to help our businesses and residents as we learn to adjust our life with COVID. There is a wide range of supports available. Make sure that you visit our COVID-19 website to see what may apply to you. Now, in the meantime, let's continue to stay social and physically distanced. Wash your hands, wear your mask in public. And I know some of you, because of health-related issues, find it difficult to wear a mask, but I ask others to recognize and wear your mask where appropriate. Let's be mindful and respect those around you. We want you to enjoy your summer outings as best you can and learn to adjust to a new normal together. Like all things new, sometimes it takes a bit of patience, it takes a bit of time. In our, in our progress over the last four months, 
is any indication we will continue to work together. We can continue to achieve great results. You've done a great job, Newfoundland and Labrador. Let's continue on this path. The last thing we want is to see a big step back. We must continue to move forward, move forward safely as Newfoundlanders and Labradorians expect us to do. I will now pass it over to Minister Hagee for his comments today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Premier. And again, we see uh, sporadic cases uh, in line with the previous ones we've experienced. These are all Newfoundlanders and Labradorians returning from work-related uh, travel. Uh, and we are going to continue to see these cases, as Dr. Fitzgerald says. This is going to be our way of life now, uh, as we talked about in the past, living uh, with COVID and L. Uh, and this will be the case until such time as there is a successful vaccine, which is safe, widely adopted, and widely used in this province. And that, uh, even under the best of circumstances, is unlikely to be this year and will be well into next year before uh, we have uh, that uh, widely distributed uh, amongst uh, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. So we need to uh, bear in mind uh, what mitigation strategies we have, uh, and we have, as a province, done extremely well thus far. Our public health and contact tracing is as robust as you will find anywhere in any jurisdiction. And it's aided a little bit by the fact that Newfoundland and Labrador uh, is a very communal province, uh, lots of people know lots of other people. And so it's really quite uh, uh, much more straightforward than it would be in an urban environment to, to engage in uh, contact tracing. And we have led the country in our ability to rapidly identify contacts of identified cases. We hit 90% in 48 hours, and that's well ahead of pretty well any other jurisdiction. The other issue is around uh, capacity. Uh, should we uh, end up with a larger cluster? Um, in the past, where we were still learning, uh, we uh, really shut down the healthcare system to all but emergencies and, and cancer patients and those kind of things. And now we've realized that our hospitalization rate was an actual fact pretty low. Uh, and we have begun the process as we've moved through the levels with uh, our alert plan uh, to reopen the, the RHAs, the regional health authorities and the healthcare system. I'm pleased to report that pretty well uh, every area uh, of activity within the healthcare system uh, has now reached the 85% target that we had set uh, specifically. We're at 86% across the province for planned uh, surgery. We are at 84% uh, with light tests, with endoscopy, and laboratory is back to, to 92%. Whilst the figures for um, uh, clinic based uh, activity within the regional health authorities are lower, at 70%, they're supplemented by a 760% increase in access through virtual care uh, to compensate. So care is out there. All the RHA clinics are open and accessible in terms of primary care. And we've been working with the NLMA to identify any barriers that might be preventing uh, privately run clinics uh, from reopening. Uh, shout out to uh, Labrador Grenfell Health, who for two weeks running hit well in excess of 120% of surgical activity. Uh, so uh, things are moving back towards normal. I've directed the regional health authority CEOs now to look at moving to 100% of their regular bed count uh, over the next week or so to try and make sure that the backlog and the wait times are addressed as efficiently uh, as possible. Uh, we still have challenges, uh, and I could echo um, Dr. Fitzgerald and the Premier's comments about kindness and respect. Uh, I have been aware on social media of a change in the tone of comments, uh, particularly after the previous case, uh, where there was a backlash against some of the harsh and really rather nasty and unpleasant uh, comments that uh, didn't need to be make, made at all. And I think as Dr. Fitzgerald and the Premier said, uh, we are not like that, Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, and I was heartened see that we do need to bear in mind that this is going to be a way of life now for some time to come. So the challenges I think that we all face are around eagerness to try and return to a normal that will not be with us for some considerable time, if ever, uh, and also some degree of complacency because we have done so well that we tend to feel maybe we don't need to bother. Uh, and those kind of thoughts, whilst uh, luring and tempting, 
uh, have not served other jurisdictions well. This virus is new to us. We are learning here, and we are looking at the lessons that we can get from other jurisdictions. And we have seen what's happening in areas where there is some slippage. Um, we went through that with, uh, with George Street, uh, and I have to say between uh, responsible uh, members of society, between the Newfoundland and Labrador Liquor Corporation, public health and service NL, uh, that is now much less of an issue. And I think with, uh, uh, with uh, the thought that went into it and the effort that went into that, we should be on the, the backside, as it were, of that slope. So our challenge as a government, as a Department of Health and as, as uh, uh, leaders in the system is to be here to explain to you the fact that things change. Uh, and if you go back and look at the uncertainties that we had at the beginning, some of those have been put to rest, but others still exist. And we have to explain in a nuanced way that there is no black or white answer. There is no magic source or magic bullet to deal with life with COVID. There is a plan that is working, and we can see it's working. So I can do no better than to close by mentioning Dr. Fitzgerald's mantra again. We have each our own checklist as responsible citizens that we must run through when we look at any activity in which we're going to engage, and that is people, space, time, and place. And you check through those, and it's your choice then as to how you uh, behave bearing in mind that the key, those key constants have not changed across the whole of uh, COVID-19 in this province. Uh, we rely on physical distancing. We rely on self-isolation uh, for those people who are potentially at risk. And masks are there, and you need to be aware of the situations in which you might need to put one on. It may not be every time, and it may not be every place. But you should have one in your pocket, and if the need arises, It'll do you more good on your face than it will in your pocket. So with that, I'll close, Premier, and hand uh, the event back to yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And with that said, we'll take this time to speak to the folks at the media. This is their time, their place to ask us the questions related to COVID-19. Thank you, Premier. For the benefit of our speakers, we have five reporters registered for today's call. Each reporter will have the opportunity to ask two questions and one follow-up. We suggest you not ask rumor-based questions. The purpose of these briefings is to address COVID-19 issues. All other government-related issues should be directed to the appropriate department or agency for response. Reporters will ask questions in the order that they registered for today's call. Our first questions are from Peter Cowan of CBC News. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned some backlash online. Uh, for example, there were people criticizing uh, some social media posts involving the last person who was diagnosed uh, playing with their children. Um, can you go over what are the requirements when people come back and they have to isolate? Some people were saying, expressing concerns, for example, about someone in isolation interacting with their family. Um, so we recommend isolation is, um, is just that, isolation. Uh, however, we have relaxed rules for uh, rotational workers, for example, uh, where they would be allowed to interact with their families when they, uh, when they came back uh, home because they have been, you know, a lot of them have been uh, through a cycle where they're basically isolating all the time and that's very hard on everybody. Um, so we did relax some measures in that regard. So people uh, may be out uh, playing with their families when, when they uh, self-isolating um, and these are risks that you know uh, the family themselves would um, make a decision a conscious decision about um, certain activities and looking at the risks and benefits of that and uh, so I think we do have to be cautious uh, we do not know anybody else's situation and uh, you know there could be extenuating circumstances which you have no idea we saw that um, the Bayview, uh, sorry, Baywatch Manor uh, in Glovertown has said that they are no longer accepting any visitors because of concerns about cases in the area. Uh, have long-term care and other facilities in the area made similar decisions, and was this something that was directed uh, by health officials? No, it wasn't directed by health officials, and in fact, um, you know, had they reached out to public health to ask advice. Uh, we would not have advised that. Um, the risk to the community is low. 
Uh, public health has done contact tracing in these cases, and anyone who has been identified as a close contact has been notified and advised to quarantine. If at uh, a future point, you know, we have to do further contact tracing, then those contacts will be advised and asked to quarantine. Uh, so there's, uh, at the moment, the risk to the community is low. Um, the people involved are quarantined or isolating. And uh, so at, at this point, we would not advise, and East, uh, sorry, Central Health uh, will be reaching out to uh, the personal care home in question this afternoon to discuss. I, and I want to ask about um, the issue that the Premier brought up around workers uh, on offshore vessels and the workers that we saw come in from Texas, which is a hotspot area. Uh, you've said that testing, is, it's not a screening test, and in fact that's why we're not testing people who come into the province. Uh, so if we're not doing that and it's not effective, why is that now being used as a reason that we can allow workers from Texas to be able to work alongside local workers on board ships, for example? Well, in some cases, Peter, there's, you know, testing can be, uh, you know, something that's recommended by the various companies. And we see this, you know, for a construction company, as an example, in, in Alberta, it could be construction companies right here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Let's, I think we need to keep in mind, too, that this is international travel, and any time you see international travel coming from jurisdictions like Canada, they come into, into Canada through, very, through four ports or through four points of entry that would have been through airports. So, and there's processes in place and having the, your, your uh, incubation plan in place, your travel plans would be in place and so on. So deemed to be essential workers in this case by the federal government, which would mean they would come to their uh, destination, their journey of destination, and this particular case would end up in a province like Newfoundland and Labrador, then would go to work, and then while they're at work, there are measures that we'll put in place based on guidelines, as I just mentioned, with masks, and then uh, they would self-isolate when, when they're not working. But in terms of the testing that you've asked, in many cases you would see companies or, or groups, could be not just companies, but groups would require people to be tested you know, before they leave, and in some cases before they would join the workplace. Our next questions are from Victoria Batcock of the OCM News. Please go ahead. Hi there. Just say the one of these two people who contracted the virus recently arrived by boat. Say they drove here from Ontario, for example. What is the protocol there? Was contact tracing completed on all the passengers on board? Can you give us some more information on that process in general? So contact tracing happens with uh, for people with COVID. They are considered infectious from two days before their symptoms start uh, until obviously till we. Uh, um, till we identify them. So uh, we go back, we find out when their symptoms started and we go back two days before. In this last case, well not the last case but the second to last case, um, uh, that person was not uh, symptomatic until after they got home and we deemed that their uh, infectious period actually started after they were home. So they weren't infectious while they were traveling. So there was no need for contact tracing of travelers at that time. Uh, if we were in a situation where um, someone was deemed to be infectious while they were traveling, in the process of traveling, then we would make announcements. We would follow up as much as possible. People do fill out self-declaration forms with their information on it, so as much as possible we would use that uh, method to try to reach people and let them know. Uh, and uh, then we would also make some public announcements um, to advise people to um, get tested if they were um, to watch for symptoms and to get tested if they were on the flight and uh, are sorry on the flight or or boat I guess um, to um, uh, to do a self assessment uh, um, with eight one one and to um, get tested if need be. Okay, and my next question would have been about airports. So can you give us an update on the protocol in place at airports when flights arrive? So I guess it's a lot of similar. A lot of similar folks. Yes, okay. yeah. So it, if if uh, indeed someone was on a flight and felt to be infectious while they were on a flight, there is a notification process for that, uh, and um, and we would uh, um, have again the self declaration forms for people at the airports. Uh, we could get them that way. We could make a notification, 
if we needed to get the manifest from the flight, we could go that route as well. So if you're and right now in, oh, yeah, if your question is about resources, if you come through, as an example, the St. John's Airport, you would see a group there that would be there taking the information, no different than what we would see in, in Port of Ass. And, of course, the uh, Fisheries and Land Resources Department are providing, you know, most of the support there, you know, recognizing that, you know, been, we've been at this a long time and there were some, you know, public health officials and so on that we would need to be able to change out. Uh, but we still have resources, human resources in place at those checkpoints. And Fisheries and Land Resources have been, you know, leading that for the most part. St. John's Airport, we have some security there as well with this information. So we still have some very stringent, uh, you know, information uh, collection ability in place at all our points of entry. And right now in level two, 50 people is the limit for gatherings in the province. Is there any plan to expand that number despite not going to level one until we have a vaccine? So um, at the moment, um, we certainly have had discussions about expanding uh, mass gathering sizes and uh, those discussions are ongoing. We recognize that, that um, it is something that you know, it is a question that keeps coming up. So uh, we certainly want to make sure that whatever decision we make is uh, is a safe thing to do and that uh, we have science behind us to support us making that type of decision. So we've certainly asked our predictive modeling group to look at this for us. Um, and uh, we've uh, also asked uh, some of the uh, um, federal, provincial, territorial groups that are looking at this, the technical advisory group, um, to uh, to look at these questions as well so you know we'll take that information and try to apply it to our local context we also have to look at our uh, capacity within our health system and also within our public health system uh, to do contact tracing should we have an outbreak in a in a gathering of a certain size we need to make sure that we're able to do the contact tracing necessary to do to uh, uh, get that under control so there's a lot of things to consider uh, when we're talking about gathering sizes thank you our next questions are from Kellyanne Roberts of NTV News. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Premier, I'm wondering where we stand with seasonal homeowners who many have applied for exemptions several times to come to their properties here. Um, they've been denied even though um, outlying their self-isolation plans, um, willingness to get tested on both ends, um, and reiterating that they're not coming here to tour around and visit. They're coming here because they own a home here. Yeah, that's a good question. It's certainly, you know, one of the most asked questions that we would get, you know, on this panel. So right now, as you know, we'll work very closely with public health, uh, as we have in the past. And I know consideration <clears throat> as a chief medical officer has just said, I mean, when asked a question about mass gatherings and changes, we'll look at the evidence and, you know, and make the decisions based on, you know, how we protect Newfoundlanders and Labradorians first and foremost. And as we open up and continue to do so with a gradual science-based, evidence-based process, work very closely with public health. But I agree with you. I agree with you. This is, you know, one of the questions that we keep asked very frequently. Thank you. And we've received many calls of concerns over American Air Force military men and women who are here on fuel stops or layovers and they're not self-isolating and are seen at the pedestrian mall, for instance, in uniform. They're not working here. They're between destinations or layovers. What's being done to monitor this? Well, from the enforcement side, I mean, if you're coming to Newfoundland and Labrador, in number one, there's there's an exemption order that would usually have to be filled in. Uh, from a, a federal point of view, if you're seeing, you know, the uh, the uh, the examples that you've just given, I mean, this is why we have enforcement in place, and we're not aware. I'm not aware of, uh, as been brought to my attention at least, of that we're seeing U.S. Armed Forces people walking around the pedestrian mall, and if uh, if you know if People would see the, and can give those examples. I mean, we have a we have a mechanism in place to actually report those individuals. And you know, for, so if you're flying here, you're picking up fuel. You know, you're not. Uh, you know, from my knowledge, at least, is is you're not expected to be or deemed necessary to be walking around streets in in St. John's. Thank you. And I know um, in your preamble at the beginning, you mentioned that if we were to do a Canadian bubble, obviously that would be done with the consultation of public health. Wondering where we stand on those discussions uh, in terms of opening our borders up to the rest of Canada and where 
uh, the other Atlantic provinces stand on this. Yeah, so you know, you're, there's I guess some uh, last night there was a discussion with the uh, my colleagues in in uh, other Can Atlantic Canadian provinces. And so right now we're seeing that, you know, that there is no movement, you know, for us in Newfoundland and Labrador right now, given the, some of the changes that we've seen in recent cases and seeing the, you know, the outbreak that we've seen in, in Prince Edward Island and really looking across the jurisdictions. And, and we know that we have a close connection to places like Alberta, places like Ontario. And, you know, even some of the reports that are coming out of those provinces within the last day or two, it, it really causes us to actually just look at this very closely and as we've always said to monitor what's happening in other jurisdictions so we're going to look at this uh, but there's no firm decision as I said to open up to other Canadian jurisdictions and in this particular case if indeed there was a decision to make any travel changes people will be given lots of notice but just opening up broadly right now is is really not something that I could see our province moody, moving into just a broad reopening so that you could actually move around uh, from any Canadian province into Newfoundland and Labrador we must continue to monitor what's very closely what's happening in other jurisdictions. Thank you. Our next questions are from Patrick Butler of Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Hi there. Uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, you mentioned the two cases uh, from the past two days are linked. Could you, could you give any more details on what you mean by uh, linked? Um, one is a close contact of the other, and I really can't give any more detail than that. Okay. Um, and... Uh, the person is less than, than 20 years old. Can you can you give any details about, you know, are we talking about a very young person, a teenager? Uh... No, I'm not going to give any further details in that age range. Okay. Um, uh, there's been a lot of changes to restrictions to long-term uh, care in the past few weeks. Um, has there been any changes to uh, rules concerning uh, employees who have a, a second job, uh, who, who are working as care workers, or, or regarding sharing staff uh, between facilities? Um, Patrick, we have made no changes to either of those. We still have a one worker, one home policy and a uh, one worker, one career kind of policy. Those are uh, under review in the light of uh, other jurisdictions, but certainly the one worker, one home is consistent with pretty well every other province at the moment. Yeah, and the Minister is right there, Patrick. We And I always like to remind people that because there were some decisions made for some of the obvious reasons at the time and they continue to be in place about the impact. So we recognize this has impacted the, uh, uh, the compensation, the financial compensation of some of those workers. I just remind people that there is a threshold that you can actually make some money uh, at a various job but also to continue to collect some of the federal supports as well if you find yourself uh, where you've seen a significant drop in compensation based on the changes that have been put in place. Our next questions are from Peter Jackson of The Telegram. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, <clears throat> we've seen a pretty passionate lobby on behalf of, yeah, of core leaders in the province to establish reason, reasonable guidelines for singing in schools and the community. Has there been any movement towards this and on the part of public health? Uh, so we have gotten uh, some information back. Unfortunately, the information is... Uh, there's not a lot of it out there and, and it's very difficult to make a decision. We know that there have been situations where um, uh, there's been what we call super spreader events in, in when uh, singing has been involved in some of those situations. And so, you know, we, ha we are very cautious. We want to make sure that the decisions we're making are um, going to keep people safe and, and are the best ones that we can make. So um, we, are, we are considering the information, we're considering the evidence, um, but we haven't made a decision yet. Okay, and can I get an idea of uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the, the workers who don't have to isolate like, coming from outside the country? Um, under the uh, travel order, there, it's considered essential maintenance. Is there any, can you, is there any way you can break down what, what exactly that means and when that exemption would be issued? Yeah, so I, I think we need to be careful when you say there's no self-isolation. Uh, self there is. And so they, when they come in, they come in with their travel plans intact by the federal government, as the example that we've just given. 
So when they're not working, they're self-isolating. And that goes back to the question that we just, uh, just answered uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, so you come in, you go to work, you wear a mask. As I said, you're not even eating together with your coworkers. So there's safety and, and precautionary approach and measures put in place uh, as an essential worker, the way you actually work in that workplace. And if these are not being followed, we have, you know, reporting mechanisms that can be inspected through, you know, Service Newfoundland Labrador as an example. So they come in, they work under those, you know, those uh, special precautions that have been put in place. And then when they're not at the workplace, they're not out and about the community, they are self-isolating, you know, for this 14-day uh, time frame. So they are self-isolating and they are continuing to work under certain restrictions. Okay, uh, and the other uh, question I have for uh, Minister Haggy was uh, we have a recent poll, narrative research poll, found three three quarters of Canadians will definitely or likely get a vaccine vaccine if one should come along. Um, and I'm wondering, given the poor uptake for flu vaccine here among adults, are you worried that there would not be enough of an uptake um, if if we did get a COVID vaccine? Certainly, that's always a worry. You need a certain minimum level of vaccination in a population to achieve uh, a significant reduction in uh, the risk to everybody. Uh, certainly, we achieve that with children. Ironically, uh, uh, when you look at it, the big picture, uh, this province uh, is at the front end of the country in terms of pediatric vaccinations with rates varying between 94 and 98 percent, which are excellent by any standard. Uh, with flu, we don't do so well. Now, we have in the past, and I remember with H1N1, if you go back that far, we actually hit over 70% for the first time ever. That's the bottom end of what you need for uptake for a vaccine uh, if uh, one can be developed for COVID-19 uh, to enable us to uh, regard this as, uh, uh, you know, something which we can move on from completely. So uh, it, it is going to be a challenge. Uh, quite honestly, given the, uh, the public view that I see, I think there will be a significant uptake. Whether it'll pass the 75, 85% threshold, who knows? Uh, you know, Peter, I think the minister is right, and he just reminds us, you know, back around H1N1, and I remember at my time in the healthcare system at that particular point in time, and, and certainly the minister was heavily involved uh, then as well as, I guess, I'm not sure about Dr. Pichirla at that yeah, time. I was. <laughs> she was, I think. <laughs> But, you know, I remember at that point in time, we were the second, not just over 70 percent, but we were the second highest jurisdiction in the country, second only to New Brunswick. So, you know, I believe, I, I think personally would say that I think Newfoundlanders and Labradorans will be quite receptive to receiving a, a vaccine based on the impact that, uh, you know, COVID-19 is having on their lives. And so I think uh, I think I look forward to the day when the vaccine is available. And I'm, I'm sure... I would be one that would be willing to step up and take it. I know we were the second best in the country before, and we would encourage others to take a real close look at what the vaccine could actually do to uh, cause some you know, more certainty, put some more certainty into, into their life. I would uh, certainly echo that. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think uh, we certainly our experience with H1N1 tells us that people are uh, more than willing to uh, consider vaccination in these types of uh, situations. And I will use this opportunity to say that, you know, there will still be an influenza season this year. So we would very much recommend that people um, step up to get uh, vaccinated against flu this year. We want to, uh, we want to try to hit that 80% mark uh, for influenza as well. And uh, um, so we really would like people to get out there and, and get their flu shots this year too. too. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald. We have about 14 minutes, I do believe, left. So we're going to go through the report again with one more question, starting with Peter Cowan of CBC News. Please go ahead. I know a lot of people are taking a look at the uh, Canada bubble, both uh, those who support the idea and those who are opposed to it. I'm wondering, can you give us an idea of what do the COVID conditions need to look like in places like Ontario and Alberta uh, for the bubble to expand? Can you give us any specific benchmarks that you're looking at and would need to be met? So we certainly, I mean, if we look at the situation, the epidemiological situation at the moment, compared to what it was at its peak, obviously it's it's uh, significantly better. But uh, in the last uh, week or so, we have been seeing a slight uptick in uh, 
uh, in some provinces and, and so that's a bit concerning for us and we certainly want to watch that very carefully and see what's going to happen. Um, as I said earlier, some of that is due to, um, you know, it's being driven by a younger demographic and um, it's felt that it's social gatherings that uh, perhaps are driving this. Uh, there's also been some um, uh, very localized outbreaks in some communities um, in in some provinces that have been driving their numbers. So it's hard to um, to just look at the numbers in and of themselves. You have to look at the context of the numbers. So sometimes uh, an increase of cases, uh, increasing cases, uh, may be related to an outbreak in a particular area that's or in a particular facility, for example, that that is then um, very quickly shut down. And and so um, while you might see an increase one week, then the next week might be a decrease or two weeks. Later, but it might be back down to baseline again. And especially if you're looking at some provinces that have low numbers to start with, um, you know, um, a small change or a change with uh, very few numbers can, can make it appear uh, like a large change percentage wise. So we have to be careful about the way that we interpret some of that uh, information. Um, the RT, again, is something that we look at, uh, but again, it is influenced by. Um, by not by small numbers and and so we have to be very cautious uh, when we're looking at that our next question is from Victoria Badcock of the OCM News please go ahead hi there as for the visitation in hospitals and long-term care homes those guidelines were recently updated but what about the age limit on who can visit for example like would a toddler be able to visit someone in long-term care we uh, don't have uh, any uh, restrictions around, based around age. Uh, we would go back then to the individuals concerned and say, you know, you have six designated visitors. That's your shortlist. Uh, do you want to put a toddler on there? And then the next question is, uh, is that a reasonable family decision? At the end of the day, there is no bar of itself from the facility, an RHA facility, uh, uh, in, in age at all. Whether there exists one in a personal care home would be a matter for discussion between the family and the personal care home operator because a lot of them are actually layering on further requirements on top of what we do for uh, seniors in uh, long-term care or regional health authority facilities. So that there may be a different answer if it's a private home versus uh, an RHA facility. Thank you. Our next question is from Kellyanne Roberts of NTV News. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm wondering where, where we're at with the contact tracing apps. Um, it was more than a month ago now that we said it would be in the Apple and um, Google Play Store. Just wondering where that process is at. The federal government changed the, the ground rule and said that to access the uh, safe start or restart money, uh, you were obliged to use the federal uh, front end. Uh, that has presented no difficulties, but it's just delayed the process. So we're, we're waiting on that. But I think that's not far down the road either. Uh, certainly uh, from my uh, briefing this morning, uh, I think we could see some movement on that potentially in the next couple of weeks. But there was a delay because the Fed changed the ground rules and wanted everybody to use their uh, COVID shield. Thank you. Our next question is from Patrick Butler of Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Hi again. Uh, question for the Premier. Um, this is likely your second last COVID briefing. Uh, what measures are you, are you are going to be in place to make sure that there's there's a smooth transition? Um, given that, that you know the three of you have really been the face of, um, I guess, delivering information to people in the province since uh, since March. Yeah. You know, it's a good question. I mean, there's a transition plan that always occurs when you see a new premier that would come into the office. So I've made my commitment to Newfoundland and Labrador and that I will stay on as long as, you know, the next leader, you know, seems that I can actually contribute in any meaningful way. And that's what I'll continue to do. I have a, a district two that I still represent. But in terms of the transition to the new leadership role, I'll be encouraging them to be as involved as I have been. I will also encourage them to you know, make sure that they work very closely with the colleagues. I think the minister has done an excellent job in representing the department. I know the uh, chief medical officer led by those officials led by 
Dr. Janice Fitzgerald here has done an exceptional job. The feedback amongst our province right now is one that's been very confident in you know, what we've seen from the work of this panel. And I will be making sure that uh, the message will come from me loud and clear to whoever the next leader is, that they continue to stay just as involved as I have been. And if there's anything that I can do to support this panel, I will continue to do that as well. Our final question today is from Peter Jackson of The Telegraph. Please go ahead. Hi, is this not a question for the minister? Uh, I heard that there are still very uh, varying wait lists for certain specialists, depending on what part of the province uh, you're in. And I'm wondering whether the, that idea that you proposed a while ago of moving patients to different parts of the province to alleviate wait lists, has that actually been implemented? That's an excellent question, Peter, and indeed I'm meeting with the Medical Association next week to discuss the next phase of uh, the uh, ideas that we floated at the last meeting, which is essentially uh, to, to pool our information. Uh, beyond uh, those um, specialists that are clinic-based in a regional health authority all of the time, uh, the ma vast majority of, of wait list information is actually held in private specialist offices. Uh, so we don't have access to that more than a couple of weeks in advance. And that was one of the issues I brought to the Medical Association. Uh, and they seem very open to the idea of pooling that information, both on a regional basis uh, and, if possible, on a, on a provincial basis. So I'm looking forward to what they're bringing to the table. And I think that's uh, uh, this time next week in actual fact. So I know from the point of view of our waitlist coordinator, uh, we're ready to put that kind of data to work as soon as we can get it. Thank you. Thank you. The time for questions has ended. Please join us again on Wednesday, July 29th at 2 p.m., 1.30 in most of Labrador. Have a great evening, everyone.